All right, it is time to go over the anatomy of the singing instrument, which is your entire body. It is not just your voice box, as you will tell and know after this section. So with that said, let's go over the very first element I would like you to be aware of, and that is awareness of the larynx. Given that, the way that I want you to process this is as if it is the heart of the matter. Let's use an analogy for this by comparing it to cardiovascular exercise. When you are running, you are concentrating on the movement of your legs, your arms, your torso, your hips. You're concentrating on everything that's happening around your heart. You're not trying to consciously make your heart beat. Your heart is beating on its own subconsciously. Everything else around it, that's what you're bringing conscious attention to. And the best performing runners are doing so in an optimal way. They study position, they study technique obsessively in order to get the best out of their running experience. That is the very same for the singer in the sense that everything else around it has an impact on the heart of the matter, the heart being the larynx. This is the thing that is controlled by uh, everything else around it. So rather than trying to raise this up or down or try to bring conscious attention to what's happening here, it is important to understand that what controls this is everything else around it. It's very important to understand that concept in order to preserve vocal health. Do not try to consciously move this. You're not going to get anywhere except bring yourself vocal tension that is absolutely unnecessary. Concentrating on everything else around it is what's going to bring you the best experience possible. Some other notes regarding the larynx, as far as its, its health is concerned. If after a few days you are, after say activity or after you're sick, if you are coughing, if you are hoarse, if you are having trouble swallowing, if you're having any of these symptoms without anything else attached to it, you most certainly should see an ear, nose, and throat doctor, an ear, nose, and throat specialist to make sure that you are not developing vocal nodes or uh, have a hemorrhage or have any type of vocal swelling. I would hate for you to go through this video tutorial with any of those conditions uh, because if that's, the, if that's the case, this is not going to be beneficial to you. I would actually stop this tutorial and make sure that you test yourself and that you're in good shape before starting any of these exercises um, so that way you can preserve your vocal health. So that covers the larynx. Let's move on to the rest of your singing instrument. All right, so it is time to go over all the elements of your instrument, which by the way, is not just your voice box. It is your entire body. Think of it like a saxophone or a tuba or any other instrument really. Even though a saxophone cannot be a saxophone without a reed, which is like your vocal folds, it cannot be a saxophone without the rest of the instrument either. You have the valves on the saxophone, you have all these other elements that are involved. So we are going to go through the elements of your singing voice by going through what I consider to be really good passive posture whenever you are standing. Some of these will also apply to when you're sitting as well, but we will cover that later on in this section. But let's go ahead and start all the way down here at the feet. So your feet are where good posture begins. So you want to make sure that whether you're standing with your feet together or your feet slightly shoulder width apart, or if you have like a wide stance or if you on either side, that the balance of your feet are balanced between your heel and your toe. You do not want to be too forward on your toes. You do not want to be back on your heel because if you do either of those two in an extreme, you're going to cause imbalances in your body. So you want to make sure that you have good footing, whether you're moving or whether you are standing still. 
Let's move on to the hips. The feet do have an impact on how the hips are placed. So, of course, that's the first step to good pelvic positioning. However, let's go over just a few ideas and steps to get your hips in the right place to impact the rest of your instrument in a positive way. So, I see this a lot from students when I tell them to balance their feet. Sometimes they end up doing this and jutting their pelvic floor forward. This is something that you want to avoid because it's going to tense up the lower abdominal muscles and the muscles in the pelvic floor. Um, which are very necessary in allowing the diaphragm, allowing the abdominal cavity to expand and get the air where it needs to be. Also, these muscles are very involved with bringing that air up, as you'll learn more in the next section coming up here. But it's very important to place the hips in a way that allows them to align with the rest of the body and not tense up this area whatsoever. So you may have to bring your hips back further than what you're used to, especially if you find yourself standing like this on a regular basis. So you want to tuck the, the, the bottom half of your body backward and then find that balance in your feet. Check back in with that. So that impacts what's happening in the torso and the lower back as well as the chest. This right here, this area right here is your engine. This is your engine for your automobile. The air around you is your fuel and this is what makes it happen. This is what allows you to make sound by processing the air around you. So given that this should be very strong and very flexible in order for it to move properly, it requires you to allow it to expand and contract, much like a belly dancer, if you will. That's what's going to allow you to use this area in your full capacity and full potential. A lot of people have a tendency to keep this very tense because, you know, society tells us we need to look nice and thin and skinny and muscular all the time. That's not the case. Um, in many traditions, especially in yoga um, and Tai Chi, they um, stress relaxation of this area, especially when inhaling. So it's important to get used to that. Now, of course, there's the other side of the coin. It does activate, it does squeeze inward and upward, and so do the muscles in the back. And they impact the portion up here in the chest as well, the posture of the chest. So if this is not being active or is too tense or too, or not compressed enough, it can also impact not just the posture, but also the sound of your voice. So this area is very important to keep in line. So hips, feet are placed properly. Hips are slightly tucked in. Spine is straight. This is relaxed. Chest is up. And now we're going to talk about shoulder placement and hand placement. So passively speaking, the arms should hang to the sides, the shoulders should be down, allowing the chest to broaden and stay up as the spine stays up. The arms, if you're in a, a place where you're standing stationary, should be hanging at the sides like so. You can get a profile here. Take a few seconds to observe what's happening with the arms and the rest of the body at the moment. And you can see where the placement is of your hands passively, your arms passively, your shoulders. Now, actively speaking, your hands and your arms can be a very useful tool when it comes to expressing yourself. Um, and that's something that we're going to cover a lot in a lot more detail in the rest of this tutorial. But to give you a slight introduction to that, um, a perfect example of how the hands can be used to help with expression is when you you maybe have seen your favorite uh, singer or, or um, recording artist use their hands while they're doing some elaborate vocal run. There's a reason for that. It's because it's um, taking three main senses and putting them together. The kinesthetic being that you're feeling the motion of your hand and syncing it with what you the the sound that you're creating, as well as visual. So it's putting all those senses together, all those learning sensory um, categories, and placing them in a way that puts them all together. So 
That's why the hands can be really, really useful in not only expressing the emotion of the piece, but also in the mechanics of what you're actually singing. We are going to actually be using our hands a lot in the vocal exercises that are going to be coming up here. So hands, arms, shoulders, they are important. Okay, so let's go into further detail about the chest and how it impacts the neck posture and the head posture. So you want to make sure, as I said before, that the chest is broad, but that it's not sticking out forcefully. You don't want to think soldier. You want to think more royal, royalty. It's relaxed yet dominant. It is not tense, which directly impacts the posture of your neck and your head. There are some optimal places that you can put the neck and the head in order to align your respiratory system properly to get to where it needs to go. So let's talk about that. So chest is broad, neck is straight, and head is placed over the larynx. It's slightly tucked in, keeping a good straight neck. That gives you a good visual of what it's supposed to look like. This is something that I see a lot of, even professional singers do, when they're going up for a high note. Or I'll see people crane their necks if they're looking to play a guitar or they're playing a piano. Uh-uh, it's a big no-no. The reason being is because that will put a kink in your hose. The hose is the larynx, the trachea, that goes all the way down to the bronchial tubes, which is connected to the diaphragm, which is connected to everything else down here. You do not want to put, put a kink in the hose. Plus, when you do this, you are tensing up the muscles in the larynx and giving no space or room for your larynx to transition from a high, uh, high position to a low position. You are locking it in and holding on for dear life. And that is not the way to go. You do not want to do that. So again, here's that visual of good posture all around in general, from the feet to the hips, to the abdomen and the back, the shoulders, the arms, the hands, the chest, the neck, and the head. And I'm going to also move around so that way you can see that this is a fluid thing. You can move the body and still stay in good posture throughout with checks and balances in between. Now, one thing to mention is that sometimes you will be in a setting where you are sitting down and singing. So everything that I've talked about from the hips down does not apply. Sometimes we cannot get good footing because, of course, we are sitting down or you may not have the ability to stand. It's, it's all dependent on your situation. So uh, the thing that I would tell you then is to take everything that we've talked about as far as the posture of the body and take it from the hips up. There's actually two bones at the bottom of your hips that you can depend upon as tiny little legs. So you can use those to balance your body if you are sitting down and take the same techniques and guidelines that we just went over and apply it from the hips up. Everything else applies. So hopefully that clears things up if you're wondering how to keep good posture while you're sitting down. So now that you have a basic understanding of what good posture is while singing and in general, let's go ahead and talk about the face. Okay, so we have covered good posture while you're standing. We have covered the many elements of the singing voice. As you can see, even at this point, it is much more than just a voice box. There is so much more involved with your instrument. And there's even more to consider in your face. So we're going to go over all of the parts of that in this section, starting with the jaw. The jaw is a very interesting piece of the puzzle because sometimes it can get in the way if it's not being used optimally. So let's go ahead and talk about the jaw's optimal movement. And we might cover something that you've never thought of before as far as your jaw movement is concerned. 
So we're going to do a small exercise to um, build awareness of that. What I'd like you to do is place your two fingers next to your ears and along the hinge joint of your jaw. They are called your mandibles. And I want you to open your jaw as wide as you can, as long as it's comfortable. So go ahead and do that. What you will probably notice is that your mandibles hinge. Your jaw hinges like a door and doesn't just go down, it goes back. It actually melts into the larynx. And for those of you who are afraid that your jawbone is going to hit your voice box or Adam's apple, I want you to also notice something else. Take your thumb, place it right here in the middle of your chin. You'll notice that there's a soft spot right there. That is not bone. That's the bottom of your tongue muscle. So your jaw, just like a cobra or a saber-toothed tiger, is designed to go not just down, but back. That is a huge piece of amplification and resonance and something that you should consider in your practice is the natural movement of your jaw. So now let's move on to the next part, which is tongue position. Now, this is a very subjective piece of material because depending on what you want to accomplish with your sound will depend upon the placement of your tongue. Now, for most singers, they want to get the clearest, most balanced, and well-compressed sound that they possibly can. So with that said, let's just assume that that's what we're aiming for in this situation. Because the tongue can get in the way, it can cause all kinds of cracks and different hiccups to occur if it is floating or if it's pressed down too much. So what I usually tell students, especially if they are singing a vowel, is to what's called anchor the tongue. Now, I wanna be very clear about what I mean here. I do not mean suppressing, suppressing the tongue completely to make it sound like, ah, I don't want you to sound like a frog that we're probably all familiar with. But I also don't want you to let it float and get that sound to occur. Um, this is a situation where you get the best of both worlds. You should anchor the tip of the tongue behind the bottom teeth and along the gum line and let the back of the tongue naturally float. Now, this doesn't mean let the stick here as you speak the entire time. That's not the case. This is only on elongated vowels and on certain phrases where you can get away with that. You obviously have to move your tongue when it comes to the consonants and to be able to discern between words and phrases. But when you are on a long vowel, like ah, something of that nature, anchoring the tip of the tongue towards that part of the body is very beneficial in getting the most out of the resonance of your voice. So let's move on to the next section, which is the lips and the teeth. These are very important pieces of the puzzle in the sense that you want to move the lips upward most of the time, especially if you're hitting things in, your, in a high chest voice because the teeth, they act as resonators. They help amplify the sound of your voice without having to go into excess effort to do so. Because this right here, that's soft tissue. So that's going to mute the sound of your voice. For example, ah. Uh... So that was somewhat muted. You could still hear what I was doing, but I'm now going to lift the lips. Uh... Slightly clearer, slightly more brightness, more amplification without pushing any more than I did the first time that I demonstrated that example. So, teeth, lips, movement of this area is very important, along with everything else that we've covered so far. Now, let's move on 
and you can look into your packet as I am as well, to the mask muscles. So we're referring to the cheeks, the muscles around the eyes, the eyebrows, this area right here. This network, relatively speaking, is massive. And it has a huge role to play in expression of your tone. The lifting of the eyebrows, the use of your eye muscles, they're all connected to muscles that are in the back of your head. This whole area right here is very essential in controlling the muscles inside of your face, which we will cover in the next part of this section, and also have a deep impact on your expression and emotion while you are performing, which we will cover much later in this tutorial. However, with that said, knowing that all these muscles work together from the jaw to the tongue to the teeth and the lips and the mu muscles in the mask, we can now talk about one of the key elements of the face that you cannot necessarily see out here. We're talking about the roof of your mouth, which includes the hard palate and the soft palate. The soft palate is a major, major key to resonance and clarity in the voice. Without it, all of us would sound like this. We would all start speaking from the nose and all this energy would go up into here. The soft palate keeps food from entering your nose, it keeps, um, uh, it's actually uh, <laughs> responsible for the sound that you make if you snore. That's your soft palate hitting the back of your mouth uh, and flapping against it. And uh, for those of you who are metal screamers, which uh, we won't be getting a lot into in this tutorial, what I like to tell screamers is that um, you should think of screaming as snoring in reverse, because the soft palate is like a sail on a sailboat or a flag in the wind. The way that you position the soft palate based upon your posture will determine how it interprets the sound pressure that's coming from uh, the rest of your body and will discern the tone as you amplify it into your resonant spaces in the head and into the room. It acts as a resonant head. It's a lot like a snare drum as well, if you think of it that way. If, if there was a, a snare drum that was turned upside down, you would be hitting it um, with, with the air that you're producing from down below. So therefore, it's important to understand the relationship that the soft palate has with everything else. Because like the larynx, it is something that you don't necessarily want to consciously control. It's something that is going to depend upon everything else that's happening around it, much like its partner in crime, the larynx. So with that said, that covers all of the elements of your singing instrument. And I hope it clarifies some things that you may or may not have known before starting this video tutorial. And so now we can move on to applying body and breath exercises.